السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious, most merciful الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all and to bless every single one of us and to grant us all goodness in this world and the next. My brothers and sisters, I started off by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I heard a response, not as grand as I would have expected, but I heard it. If one has said it on behalf of the entire congregation, it actually is enough. But I want to start off by making mention that when we greet, it is actually a prayer. And it is a powerful prayer. When I say to you, or when you say to me, Assalamu Alaikum, it actually is making dua for you, supplicating for you, that you be in peace and at peace. May peace be upon you. What type of peace? The alif and lam at the beginning of salam, which makes it as salam, actually makes it include all aspects of peace. So it's important for us to know this. Every aspect of peace be upon you. You might be perhaps in some form of difficulty, hardship, but may you always be at peace and ease. And on top of that, when we say may peace be upon you, the first thing is my declaration to you that I will not harm you because I'm the one making dua for your peace. I will not harm you. So in actual fact, I am telling you, I'm declaring to you that from me, you will not be harmed. And then I say over and above that, which means the mercy of Allah or the blessings of Allah, both of them. In fact, the mercy of Allah be upon you and the blessings of Allah be upon you. That is something unique. It is something amazing. No religion has such an in-depth greeting. I've heard some people just say, peace, peace. Yes, it comes from the Islam or the religion of Islam or the Muslimin, when they say, may peace be upon you and the mercy of Allah and his blessings. What a powerful dua. The first right, the first right that I have over you or you have over me is that you greet me and I respond to the greeting. This evening we are talking about some of the rights of the Muslims, some of the rights we have over one another. And I started this way because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ala adullukum ala amrin idha fa'altumuhu tahababtum. Should I not show you something? Should I not show you something that if you were to adopt it properly, if you were to spread it properly, it would actually result in mutual love. It would result in mutual love. One might say, why do I need mutual love? Especially the new generation. There are all these questions. They will sit with their iPad without even wanting to talk to anyone else. And they will say, why do I need mutual love? I tell you, in order to prosper, you need mutual love. In order to enjoy the few days that you have on earth, you need mutual love. In order to build your nation, you need mutual love. You need to work together. Whether you like it or you don't like it, you need to work together in order to build your nation, in order to build yourself, in order to be able to build even your family. You need mutual love. You need one another. Allah says in the Quran, Do not forget to be virtuous to one another. That virtue, the kindness, the fulfillment of rights of one another. Do not forget to be good to one another, male and female. Do not forget each other's favor. To favor one another and to understand the favor that the others have upon you. That is a great gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 
given us as a gift. So when someone says Assalamu Alaikum, it is actually a Sunnah. Sunnah means to be able to fulfill the teaching of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That teaching that may not be absolutely compulsory, but it has in it reward, it has in it virtue, because it was highly encouraged by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is why some of the scholars actually say, no, it goes beyond that, because there is an instruction of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he says, Afshu Salama. Afshu Salama means spread the Salam. You and I know that Salam also means peace. When I spread the true Salam, the greeting, when I start with the greeting, I will be able to spread true peace. How? I've just explained. Because I'm praying for peace, I make sure I will not harm. And if I pray for your peace truly, whenever I see anything or anyone trying to harm you, I will make sure that I do something to protect you from that harm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly bestow upon you and upon I the peace that we are talking about. For indeed, the primary peace is within the heart. It is within worship. When you understand your maker and you understand you are going to return to your maker, you will be at peace, you will be at ease. But when you haven't understood it, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you greet each other, there will be no peace. Do you know why? Hypocrisy creeps in. If I were to greet you, Salaamu Alaikum, just because I want to, meaning just because I have to, not because I wish to, I have to. You're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, Salaamu Alaikum. That's it. Well, I'm lucky to hear that from you because nowadays people don't even greet. There is a narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wherein he says, there will come a time when Salaam will be for Ma'rifa. You know what that means? Ma'rifa means only if I know you. If I know you, I need something from you, I know you are wealthy, I know you are in position and so on, then I will greet you. No, don't let that happen. Subhanallah. To sallim ala kulli man arafta wa man lam ta'rif. You greet all of those, those you know and those you don't know. That is right. And guess what? The response is compulsory because Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَسِيبًا When you are greeted with a greeting, then respond. The response is now compulsory because Allah is telling you, you must respond with something better than that greeting. So what is better? Someone says, Assalamu Alaikum. You say, Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullah. Someone says, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah. You say, Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. I went one above you and we stop at Wa Barakatuh. Over and above that, how do I become better? Someone said, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. I don't have much more to compete, but I can say, Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. And then I make sure that I smile in his face, or I make sure that I go out of my way to protect his image, his dignity behind his back. I will not talk bad about him. I make sure that I talk good about him behind his back. That is when I have fulfilled the right of that greeting. I have fulfilled it. The problem we have today, and wallahi, it's all over the world. People will greet you, Salaamu Alaikum, my brother. As soon as you leave, they say, that man is not a good man. That man did this, that man did that. That man is an alcoholic. You want to help him, stop telling the world what he did. Make a difference by telling him, or by praying for him, or by positively contributing towards the solution, rather than talking behind his back. If you have a problem with me, you don't need to go to the whole world and inform the whole world because that makes you not a good Muslim. A true Muslim, the right of the other Muslims upon him is that when he hears or sees something bad from him, number one, he prays for him. He makes a dua for him. That's the feeling. You have a right over me. If I see you do something bad, I need to make dua for you. Oh Allah, help that man. Not only is he a human being, but over and above that, he is my brother in faith. My brother in faith. So I make dua, I pray. Number one. Number two is, I come to you, my brother. You know, I saw something and I'd like to bring it to your attention. I believe, what am I doing? It is my right that I speak correctly with the best words 
to my brothers and sisters. Choose the best words. If Allah says in the Quran, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mawidatil hasana wa jadilhum billati ya ahsan. When you are calling towards Allah, when you are calling the people of the book towards Allah, when you are calling people towards Islam, call with lots of wisdom and with the best speech with the best reminders and even if you are arguing or debating make sure that you have used the best and most effective words this is when i'm speaking to the non-muslims what about when i'm speaking to my brother in faith don't you think it is much more important to use beautiful words my brothers and sisters so it is absolutely important for me to use the best words when i speak to you or about you that is a duty. If I don't fulfill that, I have not fulfilled my duty as a Muslim upon the rest. So this is why I was saying, person speaks behind your back, he has not fulfilled your right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا do not engage in ghiba of one another. One might ask, what is ghiba? Well, I tell you the Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said, atadruna mal ghiba. Do you know what is ghiba? He says, dhikruka akhaka bima yakrah. Mentioning your brother or sister with that which they would not like if they were present and you spoke when they were absent. To speak about your brother or sister in their absence with words that they would not like, negative words, that is ghiba. And Allah says, Would you like one of you, that one of you would eat the flesh of his dead brother? Would you like that? The answer is no. Well, to engage in backbiting is something similar. It is something dangerous. One narration says it can be worse than fornication and adultery. Because that you seek forgiveness from Allah. He may forgive you for it. Regarding ghiba, you need to seek forgiveness from a fellow human being. They may not forgive you because they are not ghafoor rahim or most forgiving, most merciful. Remember this. So it is dangerous. It is detrimental. My brothers and sisters, when you talk about one another behind each other's backs, speak good things, say good things. If you have something that is not so nice to say, say it to the person himself, but say it using good words, respectful words. If you are to talk to the non-Muslims with respect, where do you think you are when it comes to the Muslimin and when it comes to the type of words you are supposed to use with them? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. So we respond in a good way. This salam is absolutely important. I want to pause for a moment and let you know. Do you know that the rights we are mentioning, some of these rights will also be applicable to non-Muslims because they are human beings. They are your brothers and sisters in humanity. And if you were to fulfill their rights in a good way, they will then be attracted to your faith, your deen, your religion. They will then be granted guidance by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I tell you, if you are to be rough, if you think that the rights are only simply for the Muslimin and the non-Muslims have no rights whatsoever in that particular case, from among the non-Muslims, those who are considering Islam or those who are beginning to see that Islam is definitely a heavenly religion, you may find people turning away after they came so close because of bad words that came from your mouth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease. We have several narrations of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I'm going to mention tonight, where he makes mention of the rights of the Muslims upon one another. I started off with the salam because in most narrations, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger himself, peace be upon him, starts with salam. In one narration, he says, Haqqul Muslimi ala al-Muslimi khams. The rights of a Muslim over another Muslim are five. And in another narration of Imam Muslim, it is also the narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, where he says, Haqqul Muslimi ala al-Muslimi sit. The rights of a Muslim over another are six. One might think that there is a discrepancy in the number. 
The answer is no. Those were five that he was mentioning on that, con on that day or at that particular time. On another occasion, he mentioned six. And on other occasions, he mentioned other rights that were neither in these five or six. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So the first one is salam. When he greets you, you have to reply whether you like it or not. Someone greeted you, you have to reply. When a non-Muslim greets you, you have to reply. And the same rule applies. You reply with the same greeting or better than it. You have to reply. So if you know that a non-Muslim told you, Assalamu Alaikum, and you know that he did not change the words, and you know that he is genuine, you have to reply. You can either say, Wa Alaikum, which means, and to you, something similar to what you said to me, but that goes back to a hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. I must mention it so that we can clarify a point. One day, the hypocrites or the kuffar, those who detested Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they wanted to make a fool of him. They tried to, obviously they did not succeed. They said, As-Samu alayk. Sam in the Arabic language referring to death. May death be upon you. Samu alayk. So, Aisha radiallahu anha, she heard it, she was attentive and she knew that hey. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also knew what happened. So she responded, she said, Wa alayka samu wa la'na. She said, and to you be death and a curse. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Mahlan ya Aisha, take it easy, Aisha, relax. You know, sometimes you have people, members of your family get more excited than you. You know, people who want to defend you get more excited than you. Subhanallah. So the Prophet ﷺ says, take it easy, O Aisha. If one of them greets you with that, then just say, wa alaykum. Just say, and to you too. So if they say, may peace be upon you, we say to you too. That means peace be upon you too. And if they say death be upon you, you say to you too, which means whatever you said goes back to you. It's an amazing way. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ taught that. But when you know, and a lot of them are, would be genuine, Sometimes they would be happy because they know how to greet you in your language. Non-Muslim comes to you. They see you as a Muslim. They say, Assalamu Alaikum. They want to show you that I know how to greet you. So respond to them in a proper way. Wa Alaikum Assalam. No problem. May Allah have mercy on you. It's not haram to make dua for mercy for the non-Muslim. Not haram at all. I can make dua for their guidance as well. I can make dua that Allah has mercy and the biggest mercy is that Allah guides them. What a powerful dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So it's not haram. This rule where Allah says when you are greeted with a greeting, respond with a better greeting. It applies to all greetings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease. So this is the beginning where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks of as-salam. Then he says, when you are invited towards something good, you should respond to the invitation of a fellow Muslim. If you are invited, for example, to a meal, if you do not have reason not to accept it, you should accept it. Don't make cheap excuses, subhanallah. The difficulty is, if you're invited by more than one at the same time, what do you do? You know, you might say, okay, Sheikh, you taught us that if you're invited to a meal, you have to respond. Well, we are inviting you to a meal. Will you come? Obviously, it's humanly impossible to go to the homes of thousands of people at the same time. So that is why we meet here in the masjid. You know, the masjid is such a big blessing where the hadith says, whenever a group of people gather in the masjid in order to remember Allah in one way or another, they achieve the mercy of Allah. The angels surround them like what is happening right now. There is a special mercy. The angels surround them and the mercy of Allah descends upon them and Allah mentions them with who he is. Subhanallah. So right now Allah is mentioning you and I with the angels. It is there. You will feel a different sakina and a rahma, a different mercy and a peace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are in the house of Allah as compared to if you were elsewhere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. So if someone were to invite you, you respond to the invitation as positively as you can. One might say, what if there is legitimate reason for me not to go? For example, I cannot, I'm not well, or I have another commitment. Respectfully, you should then excuse yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. Then. 
something extremely important. It is known as Tashmeetul Atis. When one of us sneezes, we are taught to say Alhamdulillah, right? If you sneeze, why do you say Alhamdulillah? The sneezing has actually protected you from a sickness. It has protected you from an illness. It is your immune system that made you sneeze. So now you say, I thank Allah. All praise is due to Allah. As soon as you sneeze, you say, Alhamdulillah, which means all praise is due to Allah. It is our duty as people who are Muslimin, who have heard someone say Alhamdulillah to say, Yarhamuk Allah. May Allah have mercy on you indeed. He said, all praise is due to Allah. We say, may Allah have mercy on you. Wow. May Allah have mercy on you. So to pray for the one who has sneezed and said, Alhamdulillah is your duty. And from this, we learn that whenever anyone is saved from some ill and some evil, we should be happy. That is one of our duties. A duty of a Muslim upon another is to be happy at his or her happiness or profit or gain. It is your happy day. You are getting married. I'm happy for you. You earned a million rupiah. I'm happy for you. I'm very happy for you. Mashallah. You got married to a woman I wanted to get married to. I'm even more happy for you. Subhanallah. We're making it a bit interesting. Subhanallah. Why? Your sustenance was written there. It was not my sustenance. It's yours. You got a million. I wanted the million. You got the deal. I wanted the deal, but I'm happy for you. Alhamdulillah. That is a duty of a Muslim. This is building society, building community, building nations. Subhanallah. The ummah is built. We are happy for one another. Brother, I got it. You got it. Mashallah. It is still within the ummah. We are happy for one another. Alhamdulillah. Similarly, to be sad at the sadness of another is part of your duties unto one another. Someone passed away. Someone is ill. Someone suffered a loss. The first thing we say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We are all belonging to Allah and we will all return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Then we make a dua for them. We are saddened by it. Not that someone in competition with you regarding worldly matters suddenly suffered a loss and you say, yes, I'm so happy he deserved it. But that's what's going on in the ummah, right? That's what's going on. This is what we need to correct. Someone dies. We say, oh, he should have died 10 years back, man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from among those who do not contribute to society and community or who harm people such that they are waiting for our death. Sometimes we lead our lives in such a bad way that people are saying, Oh Allah, take this man away. Oh Allah, take this person away. And when we die, our own daughter-in-law says, Oh, Alhamdulillah, today is my Eid. I'm distributing some sweets. Will that happen? It's not supposed to happen. And inshallah, it won't. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So lead your lives in such a way that when you die, people feel the loss and they pray for you and they go to your family and they mention that they are standing in solidarity with your family. The condolence comes in a beautiful way. So to be sad at the loss of one another is a duty upon the Muslimin. We owe it to one another. I'm sad because you are sad. So much so that when you see a fellow believer not in a good mood or very sad, it's up to you to try and do something to alleviate that sadness or that suffering. If you know what they are going through and they are suffering regarding something, it is your duty to try and help. Allah continues to help a slave for as long as that slave is busy helping another. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease. So to assist one another is definitely part of our duty unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and unto one another. We will help. I will assist you because I know on the day of judgment, whoever alleviates the suffering of a fellow believer, Allah will alleviate his or her suffering on the day of judgment. Allah will alleviate your suffering on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So, one of the duties also that we owe one another is the sneeze we said is protecting you from sickness. If 
you happen to fall ill after that you fell ill someone is sick you heard that a muslim is sick you need to visit them as a duty if possible and if applicable and if it is good for them what does this mean why did i add these three things i added them because sometimes a person is in icu the intensive care unit and they are sick and they are ill and the whole community wants to visit them making them more sick and more ill do you get the point you need to use your common logic common sense the person is sick they've just had for example major surgery i will pray for them and i will go to visit them one day inshallah when they feel better three people came to visit this person and they were told you know what you cannot come in because the man is resting and they felt bad we are here to fulfill a right it is a duty on us and you are denying us access and entry well my brother you don't understand that as a muslim you need to be considerate of one another when you are buying and selling with one another and even if you are buying and selling with non-muslims the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says رحم الله امرئ سمحا اذا باع سمحا اذا اشترى سمحا اذا اقتضى الله will have mercy on the buyer who is considerate of the seller when he is buying and on the seller who is considerate of the buyer when he is selling what does that mean i have a commodity i want to sell you this commodity for example for a thousand rupiah and my cost was 800 and I'm making 20%. Mashallah, that's a big percentage, right? So you come to me and you say, brother, give me a bit of a discount. I look at you and I say, okay, no problem. I make it for you 900. And you are happy, you took it. And when you spoke to me, you told me, my brother, I don't want you to suffer a loss. Whatever your cost is, put something. I want to give you, but also make me happy. Subhanallah. What does this mean? Imagine if I was buying and I was not considerate of the seller, I would tell him, brother, give me at 500. He say, but brother, I cannot sell this to you at 500. Remember, don't ever swear a false oath when you are buying or selling items. Then you will earn the curse of Allah. Many people say, wallahi, brother, wallahi, I got it at 900. And you know you got it at 800. Allah says, those type of people, I will not look at them on the day of judgment. They will have a severe punishment. May Allah protect us from that. Don't lie. No need to lie. Say, look, brother, that's the best I can do for you. Stop that. So when you are buying, you say, my brother, I don't want it at 500, but I want, a, you know, a good price. And sometimes people will know that you are a person who is giving them a decent, reasonable price. Decent. They will know this store, the markup is very little because there are two ways of earning. Either I can have a large markup and a small turnover. Or I can have a small markup and a large turnover. Islam teaches you that the latter is better. It is better to have a smaller turnover with a large, sorry, a smaller markup with a large turnover than to have a big markup and only the elite purchase from you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So going back to the sickness, you need to visit those who are sick and ill. You need to make dua for them, pray for them. And when you visit, not just to show face, but you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, and this is mentioned in a hadith Qudsi, that, O oh, son of Adam, I was sick and you didn't visit me. And son of Adam will say, you are Rabbul Alameen. How could we have visited you? How could you have been sick? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, did you not hear of so-and-so who was ill? Well, had you visited him, you would have found me there. The meaning of this is you get closer to Allah when you visit the sick because you realize the gift that you have by looking at others from whom the gift has been taken away. Realization. That is what happens. You build your society. You build your community. You build your nation. Subhanallah. Because you are visiting the, the less privileged, the underprivileged. It is the duty of the rest of us to ensure that we take care of the widows and the orphans in our community and society. Hadith says, Ana wa kafilul yatimi kahataini fil jannah. Myself and the one who looks after an orphan will be like this in paradise. And he showed the two fingers put together. Another narration says, A person who spends his time looking after the needs of the widows and the orphans, 
shall be equivalent in reward to the one who is fasting every day and who stands in prayer every night. Amazing. Why is such a big encouragement? Because it is your duty to reach out to those who are less fortunate, those who have suffered in one way or another, those who are going through some form of suffering, your duty to look out for them. Imagine the poor in your community. If you were not to reach out to them, you would have people of other nations and other communities perhaps reach out to them with an objective that might be dirty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. May Allah grant us ease and goodness. This is why a person is sick and ill, go out, visit them, pray for them. The idea is two things. One is for them to be reassured at that time, their heart is softened. They will be reassured by your dua, by your solidarity. And secondly, you will thank Allah for what you have in terms of goodness. And this is why if the sickness then results in death, guess what? There is another right. What is that right? It is called itba'ul janaza. To follow the janaza, a person passes away. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Whether you know him or you don't know him, try to read that salatul janaza on that male or female. Try and read the janaza. And try and follow it to the degree that you get to the grave. The hadith says whoever has followed the janaza and prayed on it, they have one mountain of reward. Imagine qirat. You know what is a qirat? A mountain full of reward. And if you follow them and remain with them after the, the salatul janaza and you continue to bury them and you were there until the burial ended and perhaps helped in that barrier, you have two mountains of reward. Two mountains of reward. Why? Number one is you helped and you assisted. Number two is you got a lesson. This man was powerful. This woman was very healthy. This man was good looking. This man had wealth. This man had authority. Today, he cannot move his finger. Today, he is gone. Imagine the loss. The people who have lost him, the family members, imagine what they feel. You were there to express your solidarity. Number one. Number two is you learned a lesson. What about me? I'm also going in the same direction. Whenever you put forward a janaza to read that salah, imagine it was you. That is a proper way of doing things. Whenever you've buried someone, imagine it was you and tell yourself, Oh my nafs, Oh myself, I will be there one day and I hope there will be people to pray on me and to bury me too. So this is why it is a very, very important right that we have over one another to follow that janaza, to read salah, not just the people you know, anyone, any Muslim who passes away, you know that there is a special type of a prayer known as Salatul Janaza. Fulfill it. Make an effort to attend and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you in every single way. Another very, very important right that we have over one another is to be genuine towards one another. Ad-Deenun Nasiha. This deen, this religion is to have a genuine feeling. Genuine sincerity. I'm sincere. I have a genuine feeling. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, This genuine feeling, who should it be towards? Lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li a'immatil muslimina wa ammatihim. Amazing. And in another narration, wa li kitabihi. Genuine feeling towards Allah. You are genuine. You are sincere. You know, nush can also mean advice because advice only stems from sincerity, sincere advice. But when it comes to the broader meaning of the term nusr, it actually means to be genuine towards genuine towards Allah in my worship, in my dealings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am genuine towards the messenger. I don't just say that I love him. I love him. I love the messenger without following. No, that love must be translated into the following of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I follow the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then I am genuine towards the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that I just read the Quran and I enjoy its melody alone. No, that is part of it. But I need to try to understand the meaning of the word of Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I don't do that, I'm at a loss. So be genuine towards the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will find great benefit. You will find comfort and peace. Then he says, be genuine to your leaders. Be genuine towards your leaders. The minimum is you pray for them. No matter who they are, a prayer can only help them. Oh Allah, may you help our leaders, guide them. Let them make good decisions. Help them in every way. Let them be proper leaders, true leaders, etc, etc. That is a very, very powerful duty we have on our shoulders. Minimum is you pray for them. Be genuine towards them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us. Then we have genuineness towards one another to the degree that when someone asks you advice, they must be at ease that you will give them the best advice. The best advice. My brother, you want to open a business? Yes. It is similar to my business, but I will help you because sustenance comes from Allah. Did you hear what I just said? That is very difficult to find in the Muslims today. Brother, you want to open a business similar to mine? I will fix you. I will show you. You will see what will happen. I will make sure that you don't compete with me. My brother, how much money do you want? You already have 20 million US dollars. Give that man 2000 at least. Let him earn a little bit at least. The problem with us when we are wealthy, mashallah, those who are believers, they understand what to do with that wealth. But those who are not genuine, they don't know what to do with the wealth. They think from 20, you must go to 40 and 60 and 80 and 100. And you must become a billionaire until your name is in the Forbes book. And then you must be happy. Wallahi, when you die, when they put that Forbes book onto your chest, it's not going to help you with the angels of death. It's not going to help you. You think the angel of death is going to come and say, hang on, hang on. This man has Forbes here on his chest. Let's go away. Someone else needs to come to interrogate him or he has VIP pass. No, no. The VIP pass is with your Iman. It is with what you did with that money while you're alive. It is how much you loved another and you loved for him what you loved for yourself. That is a duty. Listen to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. La yu'minu ahadukum. None of you are true believers until until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. Why did he say that? That wording is very, very serious. None of you are true believers until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. That is serious. To show you that this life, this life is a preparation for the hereafter. Use what Allah has given you in this world to gain your hereafter, not to become arrogant on earth. When Allah gave me something, I want to share it because by sharing it, I will find Allah. When I don't share it, I don't even find my own peace and my own sleep. May Allah forgive us. I hope you understand the point I'm raising. When Allah blessed me with knowledge, I need to share it. When Allah blessed me with expertise, I must share it. When Allah blessed me with wealth, I must share it. When Allah blessed me with health, I must use it to help others. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me something unique, I must share it with others so that when I die, it remains and I got closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if I kept it to myself as I die, it dies with me. That's what happened. It dies with me. You were an expert rocket scientist, but you did not teach anyone anything. When you died, another man would then perhaps figure out on his own, whatever you had figured out, it was a waste. Reinventing the wheel. The wheel, my brothers and sisters, has already been invented. You can now perfect it. Credits go to those who invented it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. So this is something you need to understand. I need to understand love for one another. What you love for yourself. That doesn't mean if you love your wife, you need to divorce her for someone else. No, not at all. But it means you pray that they too get a good wife. That's where it goes. I hope you understand. You have wealth. It doesn't mean I love all this money. So give all of it away. No, you can give part of it away. But you pray that Allah give the others something similar. You have a hardware business, no problem. Let others also have a hardware business, no harm. Don't cut one another in business. 
La tahasadu. Don't become jealous of one another. La tabagadu. Don't have hatred for one another. That's the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. La tadabaru. Don't turn your backs on one another. Kunu ibad Allahi ikhwana. Be brothers, worshippers of Allah, as brothers. Subhanallah. You are going back to Allah. No need to have all these dirty qualities against one another. May Allah help us and guide us. So in the same way that we should be loving for our brothers and sisters, what we love for ourselves, we definitely need to dislike for others what we dislike for ourselves. Imagine a person enters a room and he turns on the air condition because he likes the room to be cool. And after him, someone else comes and he goes away. And he tells the brothers, make sure the air condition is turned off because we are wasting electricity. And then he walks away. What happened? Something is wrong with his Iman, with his Islam. He has not submitted unto Allah in the correct way. When he goes out and say, brothers, leave this air conditioning unit on in the same way I felt heat. These people will also feel hot. Leave the air conditioning unit on when they all go then turn it off. Or when the weather becomes a bit better, then turn it off. Now you are becoming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you understand that the others are the creatures of Allah, you become close to Allah. For as long as you think you are the only one on earth, you are very far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of the people, they are so selfish. They think I am it. That's it. It's all about me, me, me and me and just me and myself and I. That's it. If that's the case, you are far from Allah. To get close to Allah, you need to be close to the group of people. Yadullahi ma'al jama'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how his hand is with the group. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Something has just come to my mind that I've been speaking about lately. And I want to repeat it because it helps us on our topic here or in our topic. I tell you, there is a hadith where a man was compassionate towards a dog by giving it some water because he says, That's what he said. He said, this dog has become as thirsty as I was just before I went into the well. And the dog does not have a means of going down to the well. Let me go down into the well and fill my own shoe or my leather sock with, with water. And I come back up and I will make an effort to actually quench the thirst of the dog. As a result, Allah says, we forgave him. We forgave him. Do you know for what? Because he loved for the dog what he loved for himself in terms of quenching of thirst. He said the words are mentioned in Sahih. Hadith of Rasulullah He says, this dog is as thirsty as I was before I went into the well. Amazing. So Allah says we forgave him because he was compassionate to a creature of ours. If Allah wanted, that could have been a better animal. <laughs> you know, a dog, if someone says a dog, there are two, three ways of saying dog. You know, if you say dog, it becomes a swear word, right? And if you say doggy, doggy, it might be a compliment. I don't know. According to some people, depending on what you say, but you and I know that as Muslimin, there are rules and regulations more regarding dogs than other animals. Do you agree? You cannot just keep a dog for no reason. There must be a valid reason for you to have a dog with you. Perhaps for farming, perhaps for security, perhaps a blind person. Those are permissible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the example of a dog. With us, we are talking here about loving for your fellow Muslimin, what you love for yourself disliking for them what you dislike for yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in this regard. The tongue, my brothers and sisters, it needs a topic on its own. Al-Muslimu, man salim nasu min lisanihi wa yadihi. That is one narration. One of the riwayat says, a Muslim is he whom all the people are safeguarded from the evil of his tongue and his hand. You don't speak bad, you don't do bad, you only do good. Towards whom? Towards all the people. But there is another Sahih narration which says, Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi. 
More importantly, a Muslim is he whom the rest of the Muslimin, they are safeguarded from the evil of his tongue or his hand. No physical harm, no verbal harm. Today we verbally abuse our family members, our spouses, our children, our parents, our uncles and aunts, our in-laws. We verbally abuse them. We say bad words. We swear them. We swear people, those who work for us. We think that we are their gods besides Allah. The way we treat them. My brothers and sisters, change that. Change that. You want the mercy of Allah? You want to be healthy? You want to be cured from your sickness? You want Jannah? You want goodness in your grave? You want special treatment in your grave? Well, treat the other creatures of Allah specially, and Allah will treat you with special treatment. You get close to Allah through getting close to fellow human beings, fulfilling their rights. You will get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Watch your language, my brothers and sisters. The hadith says a true mu'min is not vulgar. A true mu'min is not abusive with his tongue. So don't be. These are some of the basic rights, subhanallah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kullul muslimi ala muslimi haram. The entire Muslim is haram upon another Muslim. You might say, what does that mean? What do you mean you are haram on me? You know, haram for us is when you want to eat something or do something, they say haram. That means stay away from it. So how can you say a Muslim is haram for another Muslim? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains, he says, Damuhu wa maluhu wa irduhu. His blood is haram for you. You're not allowed to spill the blood of another Muslim. Today across the globe, we are facing a new type of fanatical extremism where you can utter La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a million times and people will still say, this man is a kafir. Why? For what? Watch your tongue. Watch your tongue. That was absolutely unnecessary. Not only unnecessary, unacceptable. That's not the behavior of a Muslim. Civil wars have started in nations like Somalia because of this type of behavior. People calling each other kafir. It resulted in them killing one another. And it resulted in destruction of the entire nation 30 years on and no hope for the building of the nation. Why? And I've given you one example. Let's never let that repeat itself. Watch it. The Prophet says, Kullul Muslimi ala Muslimi haram. Damuhu wa maluhu wa irduhu. A Muslim is haram for another Muslim to usurp or to take his blood, to harm him, to kill him, to attack him. Haram. This is what is haram for one another. Don't harm one another. Don't ever think that it is your duty to kill someone else. No. Not at all. If someone is trying to take your life at that moment, you have the right to defend yourself. But that is given by all the laws, including the Sharia. But if someone is not harming you, subhanallah, even if they belong to another faith, you don't have the right to harm them just like that, to kill them, to take their life away. How? That is not a Muslim. You do not believe. Allah says it clearly in the Quran regarding the nafs. Nafs meaning the soul, the life given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know what he says? Whoever saves one life is similar in example to he who has saved entire humanity. And whoever takes one life away is as good as one who destroyed or killed entire humanity. How can you take the life of someone else away? That life was given by Allah. Are you Allah? Are you the giver of the life? Do you really think that you are the God? The one who gave you life, gave him life, gave her life, gave the other creatures life. So much so that you have to be compassionate towards dogs and pigs. Did you know that? I'm talking of animals. I cannot just say, okay, my brothers, pigs are haram, pigs are bad. Go out and kill every pig you see and kill it in a brutal way. That's not Islam. That's not Islam. You know, even when you want to eat an animal and you have the right 
to slaughter the animal for consumption purposes, the hadith says, إِذَا ذَبَحْتُمْ فَأَحْسِنُ الذِّبْحَةَ Allahu Akbar. Even when you are slaughtering an animal for consumptional purposes, be the most compassionate towards that animal. Don't even show it the knife in advance. Make sure that your blade is sharp so that فَلْيُرِحْ ذَبِحَةَ Allahu Akbar. Speaking about animals, make sure you don't make the animal suffer. What about fellow human beings? What about Muslimin? Today, a lot of us are suffering at the hands of one another more than we do at the hands of the non-Muslims. Do you know that? Why is this the case? Let's change it. Let's go back to Allah. This is the deen. Islam is such a beautiful faith that it does not need you to go out and tell people, I want you to be a Muslim. It only requires you to live as a true Muslim and on its own, it will be inviting others towards the beautiful faith. They will see you. You are sober. You don't drink. You don't engage or partake in intoxicants. You are a good person to your family members, to those whom you mix with. You always have a smile. Try to keep that smile on your face. Even when you are going through hardship, Try and keep a smile. You will feel like that hardship is alleviated. When people see that you treat the Muslims and the non-Muslims with respect, they are human beings. When they see your kindness towards animals, trust me, they will see the life and say, this is the life I want to lead. But no matter how much you've invited them, if they only see killing and attacking and swearing and harming, where do you think they're going to go? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. The second part of the same narration, the Prophet sallallahu says, Maluhu. Maluhu means his wealth is haram. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la ta'kunu amwalakum baynakum bil batil illa an takuna tijaratan an taradim minkum. Wa la ta'kutunu anfusakum. Inna allaha kana bikum rahima. O you who believe, do not consume falsely the wealth of one another. Do not usurp the wealth of one another. Don't steal to ask for interest or to participate in usury and interest is haram because it makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. You need to understand that to do that, you are usurping the rights of others. You want to help help when Allah has given you wealth. Don't think of giving it to the poor and extracting from them 10%, 20%. Give it to the poor and extract a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having loved for your brethren what you love for yourself rather than eating the interest and earning the curse of Allah. فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ If you are not going to give up eating interest and consuming it, let you know that there is a war announced against you by Allah and His Messenger. I don't want that to happen. I cannot allow that to happen. I need to help people with the wealth I have, with the expertise I have, rather than making them work for me in a way that I keep myself rich and I keep them working class, completely as poor as ever. And when they defaulted payment, I take away their house. I take away their belongings and I sell them in order to make sure that my interest is paid. That's not Islam. Islam has an economic system that would result in the entire world becoming wealthy, not just the rich. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. May He guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. When we say the wealth of another mu'min, a Muslim is haram upon you. It does not mean that the wealth of the non-Muslims is halal on you. No, not at all. For them too, you fulfill their duty. You fulfill the rights. You need to understand what it is. Your dealings should be upright. But when it comes to a Muslim, it is reiterated and it is emphasized even more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Then he says, Wa'irduhu. Do you know that the reputation of a Muslim is sacred. If you are to falsely accuse a Muslim, you are punishable, defamation. Falsely accuse them. At the same time, if you speak bad about someone behind their backs, we spoke about it slightly. I'm just going to quickly touch on it again. You are responsible in the eyes of Allah. 
you will taste the punishment in this world before the next. Remember that. Allah will create others to do worse to you compared to what you did to someone else. So don't think you can get away. Well, who knows what I did against this brother? Allah knows. And guess what? He will deal with you. So what's the way out? Well, I need to go to him and say, brother, go to him and say, my brother, I'm so sorry. I did something wrong. I spoke about you behind your back. Forgive me. He might want to say, what did you say? <laughs> now you're too embarrassed. Well, please, my brother, forgive me without even knowing what I said. I won't say it. You know what I have told people who say that to me? I say, well, I'm sure your statement has tied a knot, which means I'm sure it caused a problem. You need to go and undo that knot by now speaking good about me, subhanallah, to the people whom you spoke bad about. The same way you are coming to me and tell them I was wrong. That is when you will undo the mess that you made. What's the point of speaking bad about someone, spoiling everything, and then coming to them and say, forgive me. They say, I forgive you. But there is evil in society and community that remains because of your doing. So a true mu'min would go back to everyone, say, look, my brothers, my sisters, I spoke bad about this sister or this brother. And I'm very sad about it. I asked them to forgive me. And I want you don't believe what I said. I was wrong. Now you're talking business. Now you are genuine because you are not embarrassed to undo the evil you did so that on the day of judgment, you are not caught. And so that in this world, you don't taste the damage and the harm of what you did. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So for us, for us to protect the reputation of one another, the dignity of one another is absolutely important. Say good things about one another. Don't say this man is a thief. Why is he a thief? Why? What happened? Subhanallah. Has there been a case against him? Was it proven? If not, you haven't even given him a chance. Perhaps he's not the thief. You will get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and find yourself in the wrong place. May Allah never ever cast us into hellfire. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, there are so many other rights. I will mention a few. We spoke about jealousy. Don't be jealous of one another. La tahasadu. Don't be jealous of one another. We need to understand Allah says in the Quran, Help one another, assist one another to achieve that which is righteous and that which is filled with God consciousness. If someone is trying to do something good, it is your duty and mine to help them even by a good word, even by a prayer. Don't harm them. Someone wants to start up an institution. Someone wants to do something good. Someone is now declaring that they want to wear the hijab after they did not used to wear it. For example, someone has decided he wants to uphold his faith and read five salah a day. Someone has decided he's going to do something good. Wallahi, it is your duty as a Muslim to support him, to help him, to give him encouraging words or her and to facilitate it as best as you can. Wallahi, it is your duty. It is called a ta'awun ala al-birri wa taqwa. Helping one another in God consciousness, righteousness, in the obedience of Allah. You have to help. The Quran has an instruction to say, help one another. When it comes to achieving something good, the minimum is make dua for them. Today across the globe, brothers and sisters are so embarrassed of the deeds of some people who don't even follow the Islamic teachings, but they call themselves Muslims that they find it difficult to declare their name as Muslim. I had a brother who always had a nice beard, mashallah, a good brother. One day he shaved it, gone, out. I didn't recognize him. I looked at him, salamu alaikum. He looked at me, wa alaikum as salam, and he smiled. I thought, yes, it's the same brother. But I said, brother, is it your brother? I know. He said, no, it's me. It's me. I said, well, what happened to your beard? I'm going to the United States. I'm traveling on holiday. So I thought I'd just take it out. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Now I want to tell you, I looked at him. Okay, I spoke to him. I gave him a few words of courage. I didn't doom him at all because I thought that wasn't, that wasn't the place to say things that were negative. I wanted to understand him better. And guess what? That action is the result of the action of some others in the name of Islam. Those actions were not Islamic actions. People did some things that gave us a bad name. And at the same time, other people are trying to hide their identity. All I told him is my brother, 
if you went to the US with your proper Muslim identity and you happen to be the best possible Muslim and you reached out to everyone and anyone, at least you will contribute towards the changing of perception. But if you're going to go there, you've already taken off your beard, you've taken off your hijab, you've put on a miniskirt and you go with your name. They ask you, what is it? You say, my name is Dija. You know what is Dija? Short for Khadija. Astaghfirullah. But they say Dija. And what's your name? My name is Mo, by the way, Mo. What, what's Mo? Mo is Muhammad. You have such blessed names. They look at you. They don't even think you're Muslim and you're such a nice person. Why don't you promote Islam by saying I am Khadija and he is Muhammad. And guess what? We are Muslims and guess what? They will now realize that, wow, you guys are really cool guys. You guys are really good people. You, we thought Muslims were bad until we met you. Now that we've met you, subhanallah, we've changed our perception. That's what will change it. Not giving up your identity. I don't need to give up my identity. They might harass me a little bit. They might stop me, for example. It's their right to make sure that you are not a person who's going to come in and start harming everyone. So at the airport, by default, they might search you a little bit more. Guess what? If you were to cooperate, they'd also learn that no, not everyone is like this. You say, no problem. It's your duty to check me. Please check me. I will feel even more safe that you check me. Check everyone else. You know, subhanallah. They might have just found someone who intended harm and you were saved from that harm. But don't get angry. You know, people look. He's searching me because I'm a Muslim. You're searching me because this. Possibly that might have happened. Yes. But don't react that way. If you want to change it, react in the correct way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. All this is stemming from helping one another towards to do good. Ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa Wa la ta'awanu ala al-ithmi wa al-udwan. Don't help one another when it comes to evil, when it comes to sin. Then you got to excuse yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May we be from among those who understand each other's rights. What I've mentioned tonight is only a tip of the iceberg. And it's to show you that wallahi, we have rights to fulfill for one another. I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, as you are leaving, greet one another with a smile. There is a hadith that makes mention of the, the benefit of greeting one another. Assalamu alaikum. You shake each other's hands. Obviously the males with each other, the females with each other. And at the same time, you will find the blessings of Allah descend. Even your sins are forgiven according to one narration. Even your sins are forgiven. So tonight, from tonight, starting now, make a difference inshallah. Start greeting one another. Learn to love one another. Learn to eradicate the hate that you have in your heart for one another. And you will find with a pure heart, even the salah that you, you fulfill will benefit you more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.